Today we have the privilege of having Kathy Breen back again. Kathy is, is a Catholic worker from New York City. She is a Voices for Creative Nonviolence member and has traveled to Iraq numerous times. She has just been in Iraq this past May, so her information and her experiences there are very current. And um, we're delighted to have Kathy back, back again tell us and give us a, an important update on conditions in Iraq 10, 11 years after occupation. Please welcome Kathy Breck. Kathy Breck. Breck. That's right. <laughs> oh, well. What's in a name, right? Yeah. You got the first name. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, I have so much I want to say and so little time to do it that I get nervous and so I'm going to sort of stick to my notes and um, and just ask for your understanding if I if I'm sort of scattered thank you uh, John the pictures are very important to me and we had a little bit of trouble with the apple versus bell and whatnot um, we get so little news from Iraq, and according, as you know, to the media, uh, the war against Iraq ended when, with the troop pullout, the end of uh, 2011. But but nothing could be farther from the truth that the war is not over in Iraq. Um, I want to start with April 15th of this year, which was a very momentous day. Uh, it, and the front page of the New York Times, blasted Boston Marathon, killed three and injured 100. And the war zone, war zone at mile 26, so many people without legs. And some, of, uh, some friends from Iraq sent condolences by email, and this is one, I wanted you to see this, we mourn with Boston. Um, and, and I got other condolences too. Please know and tell people of our grief at this. So these, this was coming out of Iraq. Next picture, please, John. So when I went, I was able to go back to Iraq as part of Voices in October, November of last year. And it was the first time in nine years that we were able to go back. Uh, I'm not talking about Kurdistan, I'm not talking about northern Iraq, which has been relatively safe. But we finally decided to try to test the waters and go back. And so for me, it was a very meaningful trip. Uh, and my question was, how is it nine years later? What are people experiencing? So it was a reconnection with old friends, that, some of whom we hadn't seen since the war, uh, or since the into eight, nine, ten months into the occupation when we were also able to go back as voices in the wilderness. Uh, we made the decision in January of 2004 as voices in the wilderness that we could no longer go back to central or southern Iraq because we would put Iraqis in danger by their mere association with us. So this trip in October, November was really a special trip uh, for me and for us as voices and for the larger peace community. And of course the question was, like I said, how are people doing? Um, and I was able to go to, at that time, to Najaf and Karbala, of which I'll speak, which are totally Shia areas because the holy shrines are there, holy to all Shia Muslims and many, many pilgrims, and also to Ramadi and Fallujah, which are exclusively uh, Sunni areas, and also to Basra, a short trip, and to Baghdad. And uh, the last image I had on that trip in late November was, before I got on the plane to come back to the States, was this child, and his name is Mohammed. And his uh, orthopedic technician, a woman, brought him and his father to the house where I was staying um, with the question, could you help him get a simple prosthesis for his arm? When he was uh, eight, or no, six years old, he was coming home from school. He stepped on an electrical wire of a pole that was downed by a U.S. bomb, and he lost both his legs and both his arms. 
And when he puts on the prosthesis, his dad puts them on, he can stand and walk. I, I mean, he was just one of the most courageous young men, uh, but he doesn't speak. And his mother went blind as a result of this, and she's still blind today. So I don't know how many people know that on this momentous day of April 15th, there were 18 bombs in Iraq, and at least 32 people died. And I couldn't write about this until I got to Iraq in May. But my question was, how many people sent condolences to Iraqis over the last 10 years? You know, because this is like a daily occurrence to them. Next picture, please. So this is the um, Tigris. No, this is the Euphrates, sorry. This is in Najaf. Uh, and this is the Euphrates River, which looks so beautiful. Uh, what did I find nine years after the, my last visit there, 10 years after the war? That there's no potable water, you know, still. I think the Iraqi budget for this year is $346 billion, and they still have no potable water and no national electrical grid. Um, next, please. This is sort of the sophisticated water system you have to have in Najaf, which a lot of people can't afford. Uh, you have to buy the filters for this. Uh, the Euphrates River, which comes out of, uh, down from Syria, feeds Najaf and Karbala. Next picture, please. This is the sun setting over the Tigris in Baghdad. And this river is not quite as polluted as the Euphrates. Next picture, please. And this, they can use this kind of water filter, which this can be washed by hand. It's a charcoal filter. So, um, next picture, please. But I was able to visit hospitals. This happens to be in Najaf. It reminded, reminded me of visits on, to Iraq under the sanctions. You know, half of the kids in this room that we visited, the six children, were there with gastrointestinal problems uh, because of the wa drinking water. Next picture, please. So I spent a lot of time in both visits, both in the six weeks I was there last year and the month that I was there this year, in Najaf and Karbala and uh, got a, a Shia perspective, I think. And uh, it's, I'm sorry it's a little dark, but this is a lovely um, holy teacher of the Quran from Najaf. And we were able to travel to Basra together. And he was on the front, in the front seat. And I had been with him the night before in a little gathering at his house and met his wife. And he heard we were going to Basra, and he asked if he could come. So I had a very good translator with me, and I asked if we could continue our conversation. And what I want to do in this short time we have together is to really let Iraqis come to words. So I apologize for reading, but I want to quote them. So um, I asked him, Said Saad, and by the way, the black turban means that they're direct descendants from Mohammed. And uh, he's not a sheik. I learned this. Uh, he's a descendant, a holy teacher of the Quran. Uh, when you see the white ones, they are sheikhs and not necessarily direct descendants of Muhammad, but a gentle, mild-mannered, very um, open-spirited and uh, educated man. Uh, so in the car, we continued, continued our conversation, and I asked him what he felt the effects of violence had been on Iraqis. He responded through a translator that the Iraqi people were living peacefully, different groups together side by side until the Iran-Iraq War, which was from 1980 to 1988. Then um, wealthy and poor alike were sent to the front to fight. And this was the outbreak of violence. We consider the American people, he said, represented by the soldiers who fight the war against us as war criminals. We saw how they were cruel and savage, how tanks ran over innocent people. It became normal for every household to lose loved ones. We saw terrorists whom we caught and handed over to US troops later released. Many wrongs are credited to Islam. The US was wrong to bring terrorism to Iraq. The Iraqi people are religious. They will become strong and resilient again, he said. Next, please. 
So this is Najaf, the graveyard. And this is a friend, uh, an Iraqi woman that I actually met in Syria. She and her family fled to Syria. And now because of, they've had to come back to Baghdad. And, and I couldn't go to her neighborhood in Baghdad. It was too dangerous. And so some of the family came by bus to me and Najaf and we visited the grave of one of her brothers who had died a year before. Um, it was just wonderful being sort of a pilgrim myself to see the pilgrims uh, on the streets coming to the holy sites. Uh, Najaf and uh, Karbala are sort of sister cities and it's very important, um, the walking. And everyone in Karbala, for instance, uh, where there's a holy shrine, uh, Imam Hussein, and here in Najaf is the holy shrine of Imam Ali. Uh, they get pilgrims from all over the world. And under Saddam, this was not permitted, their commemorations. And one of the things I just find so amazing is that on April 20th, 2003, just maybe 10 days after the fall of Saddam's regime, four million pilgrims came to Karbala. It was their, one of their feasts. And, and I just remember our young Muslim friends in Baghdad with great emotion talking about this. So um, it's like every, it's the largest cemetery in the world here in Najaf, and it's sort of every Shia Muslim's desire to be buried in Najaf. Mm -hmm. And people come from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, to these holy sites, and not just Shia, also Sunni. Next, please. Oh, and also in Karbala, uh, now they get 12 to 14 million people visiting on their holiest of feasts. And everybody in Karbala opens their house, mm -hmm. everybody. They bring the washing machines out in the front lawn, they buy t-shirts, they do foot massages, they serve meals, they, it's just, I wrote a piece, uh, a lesson in hospitality because I was just so moved. This is Baghdad and um, I'm sorry again that it is a little dark, um, but I'm going to visit a family who, have come, who had come, fled to Syria and who had come back. Um, and they lived like, there are like market uh, souks, you know, that go, they live up top here, the family, in an apartment, in the market area, and it was just wonderful. I had to keep a very low profile. I had to wear the, the veil in Najib and, Najib and Kar Karbala because all the women are covered. And in Baghdad, I did too, and I, I because I'm an older woman, and, and Ray spoke about this, I really capitalized on my <laughs> older state in life, you know. So they would put me in the front seat and I would have the, my glasses on for distance and I kept my eyes down and just minded my own business and, and they just waved us through all the checkpoints. Because I was old and because there's this respect, you know, so even in Baghdad I, I, I wore the hijab. Please, next. But I, that's me. <laughs> but the reason I tell you this is because I was home a lot, I, I really was homebound. I, I couldn't take a walk, you know what I mean? I, I didn't walk around, I wasn't. So when I was in this market area with the colors and the, I, it was just like all my senses came alive. And I just wanted to say that. I, I just had to show you this picture because it was like, oh my gosh, you know? So my uh, translator and guide and driver had his, he was taking pictures of me with his little camera, but uh, they, they gave me an, a name, Um Noor, so when they called me out in the public, it wasn't Kathy, which is a very Western name, mm -hmm. so as not to draw. Next, please. You can't go to the Middle East, as you all know, without talking about hospitality and food preparation, and I just had to include some of these pictures. Yeah, this is a family I visited in Baghdad, and they're making lunch. Next, please. And this is in Najaf, and this is a, a family that I stayed with, and it was all women and children. And uh, there we are, with all the mother's sisters and her mother, and having a meal. Next, please. This is in Karbala. Uh, again, they prepared a meal, and I stayed with this family. He's a dear friend who had to flee also. He was with the Muslim uh, peacemaker teams and worked in human rights. He's a high school teacher. He fled 
first to Egypt, then because of his work in human rights, and then to Syria with his family. But he's back now in Karbala, and he's teaching high school, but keeping also a low profile. And oh, yeah, I wanted to tell you, when I was in Karbala, uh, I spoke with a high school, a young man who teaches English in a village high school, right in the Karbala area. And he said, this I want to quote him, the situation is very bad in Iraq. The politicians are corrupt in the whole country. They are looking for their own interests. The regime didn't say, serve the people, now the government doesn't either. I see no hope for Iraq. The boys, his students, don't want to learn either. They have been affected by the war, turned into beasts. They have only seen blood and killing. They are violent with no principles, with no respect. He told me about a student who was caught cheating by his teacher, and she failed him. And he went to the home and killed her. And he said, this has never before happened in, in our country. And then uh, I got to know, I stayed twice on my two visits in Carver with his family. And his oldest boy is a third year uh, student of English in the University of Carver. And he, I just fell in love with him. And he told me his hobby is writing poetry. And he liked Shakespeare because, and he, was, he, he had very good English because he's studying English. And he said he liked Shakespeare because he gives the world advice to be or not to be. He said his father asks him why he's always writing poetry. And he says, I must. I cannot stop. When I write, I fly. And he told me, the war is not over. It continues until now. The damage of war is like Hiroshima. Our babies are deformed. We have many in Karbala. Many left their homes to go to other countries. Kidnappings are still happening of small children, not only for money, but, for, but to make people fear. Next, please. We're in Baghdad now. And these pictures, I think, we need to see. If I had three words to describe Baghdad, they would be checkpoints, traffic jams, and cement walls, concrete walls, which the US began setting up. So here you see the, tra the cars, the traffic jams. I took all these photos surreptitiously from a car window as it was moving. You, it's not like there are tourists or that you can. But here, I wanted you to see also the wires that are hooked up to generators. Mm -hmm. Next picture, please. These are the, this is what you see in Baghdad. Next picture, please. Cement walls. Mm -hmm. Next picture, please. Next picture, please. Again, electrical wires. And this is not just in Baghdad. This is in Basra. This is in every place. The, the electricity keeps going down all the time. And you pay, I'm going to give you ballpark figures, about $10 a month for the national grid, which is always shutting off. So people try to get hooked up to a local generator where it's a local neighbor who charges $50 a month. And this is very dangerous, you know? Ah. So that's in case, you know, the, the, when the national grid goes off, they're hooked up to uh, another grid. Again, it's very expensive monthly for them. Next picture, please. Now, I'm sorry I'm rushing, but I just bear with me. This is a, these are pediatric oncologists in Baghdad whom we've always kept touch with who are on my list of heroes because they never left the children, even when like 80% of the doctors were fleeing because of assassinations and kidnappings. Uh, this is Dr. Salma and this is Dr. Mazen. And here you see it's a teaching hospital. They're teaching the residents. And in 2006, it became so dangerous that they, that Dr. Mazen told a couple of the residents that they had to leave. They had to leave the country. And the resident said to them, you're the reason we stay. And if you go, we'll go. <laughs> and so they stayed. And when he was telling me this story, his own voice just broke. But anyway, this, this is their, one of their sources of hope, is this team that they have, you know? And so I was able to see them both in November or October and again in May, and they took me out to 
consistent. Uh, we walked through, of course, the hospital. We knew them before the war, during the occupation. And I saw the kids. I couldn't take any pictures. So you, you see, don't let these pictures deceive you. Everybody's smiling, of course, because they're posing. But I couldn't take pictures of the kids, you know? Two in a room with their mothers, bald, on IVs, crying, sleeping, uh, sick, just really sick. They, have, they had 60 children this day, but they can take up to 90. And they get half of the cases uh, in, in Iraq come to this Baghdad oncology ward. And they're, they're really my heroes. And it was a great, great uh, joy to see them again. And, and they, this is one of the reasons I think we really need to question, despite the tremendous increase in violence now, if we need to keep going back for this very reason, to just encourage people. But, but if we're going to put people in danger, that's a whole other thing again. Next picture, please. Anyway, the doctors, I want to just quote them a little bit. Uh, and this is from November. They, these quotes are... <coughs> so we were stuck in a traffic jam, and one of them said, outwardly things appear better. There's more cars on the road, new cars. Um, there's better salaries. but. But Dr. Salma was at a very low point. She said, we've been working for such a long time and we see no improvement. There was no hope under Saddam and there's no hope now. We can criticize the government now. We can speak, but nothing happens, you know. Um, nothing will change. We feel powerless to change. So you get this sense. There are certain points I want to leave you with before I finish. And one is that every Iraqi that I met would leave if they could with the exception of one who's, who's an artist and his staying is, is a type of resistance. But I mean, how tragic is that, you know? That, anyway, the, these are the wires again. I'm, um, next, please. The increase in cancer, uh, I'm going to get to that, uh, also Fallujah, um, looks like we don't have them, what about the... Anyway, um, let me just go on while we're trying to... I, I want to talk, in November I was able to go to Ramadi and Fallujah, which I was saying are very uh, Sunni areas. And I'm sorry I don't have a map here. I regret not having brought one. Um, and you know that at Fallujah, we had massive air attacks in April and November of 2004. Mm -hmm. And we've heard about that already in these t in today. And Ramadi is like the sister uh, city, and they have had also experienced a lot of air attacks and, and brutal assaults. And I was able to speak to a fifth year English, sit in on a lecture of fifth year dental students. <coughs> and um, uh, it was quite embarrassing because they, the professor sort of hurried up so that I, as the honored guest, could speak to the class. And, and so it was crap, quite awkward. And, but I introduced myself and said that I had lived in Iraq for some months and nine years ago, and, uh, and I see that there's no water and no electricity. Uh, and I said, how old are you? And they said, 22, 23. And I said, then you were like 13 or 14, you know, very mm -hmm. impressionable age. And I said, what I really would like is to hear from you. And there was complete silence. Mm -hmm. And then somebody in the front row spoke up, and he said, uh, we have nothing to say. The, the last years have been only sad ones. And then there, there was silence again. And then. A young woman in the middle of the lecture hall spoke up, and it took some courage for her to do this. You could tell, and she was very impassioned. 
And she said, it's not about water and electricity. She said, you destroyed our country. You've destroyed everything. You've destroyed our ancient civilization. You've destroyed what's inside of us. And she went like this. You have taken our smiles from us. You have taken our dreams. And then, then people began to speak. Iraqis cannot forget what Americans have done here. They destroyed the childhood. You don't destroy everything and then say, we're sorry. You don't commit crimes and then say, we're sorry. To bomb us and then send teams to do investigation on the effects of the bombs? No, it will not be forgotten. It is not written on our hearts. It's carved on our hearts. We're happy to make bridges between people, but we will not forget. What can you do, they said. In Fallujah, 30% of the babies are born deformed. What can you do? And then someone spoke of meeting an American soldier in the airport who was part of the special forces in Iraq. The soldier told him that the Bible tells us not to kill. But we were taught to kill, to kill for nothing. Just kill. I'm sorry. Build bridges, he said. Apologize. And there was no rancor or rage in his tone, just anger and deep uh, pain. So we can't get this back. Can you try the fl flash disk? Um, I, I'm trying to do this. So let me just tell you a couple more stories just mm -hmm. to, to use the time. Uh, on more than one occasion, I had a young 23-year-old woman translating for me in Baghdad uh, back in October, November trip. And she had gone to the University of Musansaria <coughs> in English studies. And she was about 13 uh, when the 2003 war on Iraq broke out. And I asked her how she felt the war has affected her country. And she said, people have changed. They think of themselves. <coughs> it's not good. Things have only gotten worse. Children 8 and 10 years old think of weapons and killing. They do not have the thoughts of children. I would be afraid for my children growing up in this atmosphere. I have never felt safe since the war, she said. We've forgotten the real meaning of safety. I hope it doesn't get worse because it's my country. I hope for all the good for it. She wants to be a teacher. She says the mass <coughs> exodus of the professional class has had a big effect on her generation. I'm afraid the level of education is very low, even in the colleges, she said. <coughs> The good teachers left the country. But she wants to teach the new generation in the right way, not as her teachers taught her. I want to do good, she said, to positively affect society. I have hope for the future, and I wish the goodness in people becomes greater than the evil. And I want you to see her face. That's why these pictures are important. Maybe, we'll see, inshallah. Iraqi people are very kind. But after the war, many changes happened to the psyche. If there is safety, then the behavior of people will become better. And by improving basic services, the government should fix the electrical system, the water system, the roads, make jobs for those who graduate. There is corruption inside every ministry. Change has to come from inside the government itself. Um, anything, John? Yeah, in a second I should have something for you. So you'll see some of these pictures, but I was able in the no October-November trip to make contacts with the Dominican sisters in uh, Baghdad. Uh, Ed and Cynthia might remember them and some of you who might have been to, to Baghdad. Uh, they're still there across from, in Carada, across from the little San Rafael Hospital, and I was able to meet with Sister Marianne, who still is the administrator of San Rafael Hospital. And, but most of the Christians have fled. Uh, 
This last trip in May, I met, I was not able to go to Mosul to visit Christians there, it was too dangerous. I was not able to go north of Baghdad to Diyala uh, to see friends there, it was too dangerous. And I couldn't go to Fallujah and Ramadi this time. And someone was supposed to come to me from Ramadi, a woman, she, we were very excited at meeting up, and she called me the day before and said, Kathy, I can't come, it's too dangerous, the roads are just too dangerous. Um, oh yeah, there's the Dominican sisters. And oh, I wanted, one of the reasons I selected this photo is, and they laughed because I had the hijab on, right? And, um, they knew Sister Anne Montgomery, and they had not heard that she uh. had passed away about two months prior. So they were also, I think, grateful and sad. While saddened, they were also grateful to get that information, you know. And I had hoped to go see the Missionary Daughters of Charity, who had an orphanage there of severely handicapped children that some of us knew. And they still are in Baghdad, but they've moved. But I just timed them allow. But they still have a school. And I asked them if they have Christian children in their school, and they said, we don't have Christians or Muslim. We only have Iraqi children. That was their mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. But this is Sister Teresa, who is the principal of the school. But there's a lot of tension, and you, you could just tell. Uh, but it was just a great joy to be able to make it. It was a sort of, nothing short of a miracle that I was able to find them. We were able to find them. That's my translator. Oh. And she's a Muslim young woman who refuses to wear the hijab. Mm. And she's never worn the hijab. And her mother does wear the hijab, and her grandmother does, but she, she hasn't. Although when we went to visit certain families, and we were in that area where the mosques were, she, of course, put on a head covering. Next, please. Uh, one of the things I also wanted to do, and I'm sorry, I am jumping around now. Are you still with me? No. You know, I worked for quite a few years uh, in Jordan and Syria following Iraqi refugees, Iraqis who have fled to Jordan and Syria. And so one of the things I hoped to do in Iraq was to reconnect with families in Syria who, because of the violence in Syria, have had to come back now to Iraq. And this is one of the families that I was close to in Syria. And they had this little boy in Syria. So I have known the girls since they were little. And they, of course, want to get away from the violence, and their question was, can you help us get to the States? They don't speak English. And the father is working a very menial job, and he was, uh, was asked to join a militia, and his salary would be increased a thousandfold. Mm -hmm. And they weren't just asking him, and he said he would think about it to buy time. But he knew he was being pressured to give them an answer, and um, they had to leave Syria. They, so, you follow me, they fled to Syria because of violence in Baghdad, and then someone tried to kidnap the oldest girl in Syria. And so they came back to Baghdad, and they're trying to find their way now. So, next picture, please. Yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. This is Fallujah, the city of mosques. Next, please. This is uh, the two pictures together, sorry. But this is the family that uh, I stayed with in Najaf. Next picture, please. I just want you to see some of the beautiful faces. <laughs> Isn't she cute? <laughs> yeah, she's so sweet. Next picture, please. Roya, her name is. This is in Karbala. This is two, one picture imposed on another picture, sorry. Just so you can see some of the faces. Families I stayed with, yeah. Next picture, please. Next. Isn't she sweet? So this is Zina. She's just, I just love that picture. Next, please. Yeah, here, uh, this is a family I stayed with in Baghdad. In, uh, we're baking bread, or she, the mother's baking bread and showing me how. Next, please. So the girl, I just had these beautiful faces in front of me all the time. But it was a very dangerous area. And right down the street, like one of the boys, 13-year-old boys, had a 12-year-old playmate down the street. And somebody came looking for the uncle and took the little boy. And that was the end of him. They hadn't heard anything. So 
and we explosions in the middle of the night and, and fake checkpoints and sticky bombs. We had to check the car underneath of the car and so you know for, I'm not a fearful person by nature but I really did have some small sense of what Iraqis go through every day and yet the amazing thing is is their resilience you know please next picture Jen. Oh. so I know isn't it so their father was my um, host and translator and guide and driver next please yeah, there I am in one of my few stepping out of the house. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh -huh. Next picture, please. I, I really like that picture. And we had uh, many conversations, or several conversations, about our, our scripture and the Quran, you know, and Jesus being as the shepherd, the good. He loved the image of leaving the 99 to find the one sheep, because he's running after the sheep here. <laughs> But he's an engineer who can't find work as an engineer. And um, so he bought some sheep and is hoping that he can make enough money uh, at that. And I just want to read the next picture, please. Uh, these are just some of the lovely faces. Next picture, please. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Next picture, please. Yeah. That's the mother of a translator that I had in Syria, and um, I visit her family in Baghdad. She's in the States trying to get asylum, but that's her mom. Next picture, please. Okay, so I get this uh, message uh, from the driver translator who has the sheep, who's a dear friend. I'm bl I feel like a family member now. I, he's, he wrote, emailed me that he was going to take recently a French journalist, a female French journalist, to Ramadi. It's a very dangerous, he said, it's the first time I feel fear, mm -hmm. although I worked many times in very risky areas. I'm not afraid from death, but I worry about my kids. Who will take care of them if something happens? And at the same time, how can I feed my family if I don't work? I had the idea to take Zina or Nora, two of his little girls, with me, with us, because you're more able to get through checkpoints if you have women and children with you, you know? And he said, but I decided not to take any kids because it's not fair to expose the life of innocent kids for the risk of war. So I decided to go alone because it's my duty to work. It's not very far, but as you know, the hot weather and driving a truck without air conditioning. And nowadays, the highway of Ramadi has too much risk. Army, police, terrorists, and demonstrations in Ramadi. To reach Ramadi, we have to pass many cities like Abu Ghraib, Kandari, Al Karma, Fallujah, and Ramadi. Today, Mohammed played with me too much and, and kissed me many times, which is different from before. And Zina, the little girl in the field, slept beside me, took, and I, I t looked at every corner of the house like it might be the last time I see this house. And my oldest brother treated me well by buying bre hot bread for my family. But I never show my family the feeling. My wife doesn't know what's going on. But I trust in Allah by going on this mission. Pray for my safety. So they, these are emails that I get. So next, please. We're coming to the end. I, you just, that's her fourth birthday. That was in November. Next, please. And this is this time in May. She's giving her brother a kiss. Isn't it cute? Next, please. That was my translator that I, I read you her words. Next, please. Okay, so this is the story I'm going to end with, and and this was the, I had one more day in Baghdad, and I got an email from a friend, Danny Muller, some of you might know, and he said, did you ever run into my friend, an artist, uh, Kassin, in Baghdad? And he gave me his website, and I didn't know him. And then when I looked at his website right then, I thought, I know this guy. I, I went to this ex exhibit in New York City and saw all this Iraqi art exhibit, and his was the only one I remembered. And his, so I emailed him and then I called him and I said, Kasim, I know Danny Muller and I'm in Baghdad and would you, I'm embarrassed to call at this late date, but could you ever see me? And he said, you must come tomorrow, I'm going to cook you most goof, which is fish. And so there I, so we woke up, I wake up in the morning, it's not even eight o'clock and, and uh, my host, the father said, you're, 
you, you're going to hear an explosion. They found a bomb down the street that they're going to detonate, so don't be alarmed. So we had heard the day before that militias had been trying to take four of the main highways in Baghdad, and we had to take one of these highways to get to the artist. And on our way, a couple hours later, to his gallery, we saw this smoke up ahead, and it was a car bomb that had gone off, and they were trying to put out the flame. So just to give you some sense, you know, so we get to, we're received so warmly by him, and here he is showing us his art, and he is going to speak about another fire that happened uh, back in 2003, right after the US forces entered Baghdad, and he was sitting on a balcony watching the soldiers, the American soldiers passing by. And then moments later, there was a huge fire in the Academy of uh, Art uh, Library, Academy of Fine Arts, where he studied and where he taught. So he went there, and when he went in, he saw the books had been pulled off the shelves and set afire, and they were smoldering. And he picked up one of the books, like a fireman, he said, um, he noticed some soot-covered books that seemed to have survived intact, but when he picked one up burning his fingers, the text fell to the floor, and the pages scattered around him. Next picture, please. I think that was the last one. Oh. I think this is, these are repeats. There he is. So this is his gallery. I, I took off the hijab there. This is in the cafe right next to his gallery, which is his, and he's telling me these stories. And he said, uh, the pages scattered around him, holding only the cover. He was fixated by the little details of life that filled the inside cover. <coughs> Strips of cotton, some Arabic verses scribbled in pencil, notes written by the librarian. My imagination was reborn, he said. Here I found the essence of life deeply inscribed as signs of one's book extensive journey. I was filled with a new sense of life and hope. And so he gathered as many covers as he could get and he went home. And back in his studio, he went immediately to work with passionate fingers to transform them. And it was here that his art took a dramatic turn. People usually read the text, but I want to transfer the text to the cover to help people understand what happened. After World War II, there were art experiments made from residuals of war, like Hiroshima, for example. And what this happened to our land, uh, it seems my work comes out of tragedy, he said. He had to sell 400 books of his under sanctions in order to buy milk for his children. <coughs> Art began to die under the sanctions. We had bad colors, bad covers, not durable. Uh, we couldn't get specific colors. I'm a Bedouin at heart, he said. My decision to stay is a kind of resistance against the dirty war. It wasn't Saddam. He could have been taken out at a parade. <clears throat> there was a... So, next picture. There's one more, and we'll end on this. Now and then, I wrote a piece about this. Our host, a gentle yet forceful man, rose to tend to the most... <coughs> of, here's the fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that he was preparing. And I felt privileged to be among his guests. And then I said that I'm sad that my time is coming to a close. And let us hope and pray that Ira the Iraqi spirit may remain strong and resolute as they struggle, the Iraqi people, for peace. So it was very hard for me to leave. I, one part of me felt like I was getting out of Dodge alive, but the other part was tremendously sad to leave people in such dire straits. And something shifted in me when I came back to the States, especially Iraqis that I know who are here as refugees and who are <coughs> struggling, alone, no family. I just, and some of them that, I've been, that I'm really very close to, I've been able to say, just from my perspective, <coughs> go home. You know, you live together and you die together, but at least you have family, you know? And so, anyway, I think I'll close with that. Uh, thank you very much.